Okay. Um, so hopefully everyone can see my screen again. I think we're recording now. Um, mm -hmm. Are we? Yes. We're recording. Okay, great. Um, so now, um, Jacob, I, I can't see you, but I can hear you. Uh, I don't have, no, I don't have, um, I, I don't have even <coughs> mute. I don't have, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yes. you. Ah, you can hear me. Okay. Because here it shows mute, so I don't know. Oh, no, I, I can hear you. Okay. Um, okay. What I want to talk about um, for, let's say, about the next half hour or so is the mitzvah eating maror on, on Pesach at the Seder. Um, where it comes from, why we do it, and what maybe it means for us today. Um, so the, the Torah tells us that they that you'll eat the flesh, that you'll eat the Korban Pesach that same night. The Korban Pesach would be slaughtered Erev Yantif, um, and you would have to consume it by, by midnight. Um, they shall eat the flesh that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. So according to the Torah, there, you, one has to eat the Korban Pesach, uh, which of course is a, a remembrance um, for the the the, Pesa, the sacrifice, the Koran Pesach that was brought in Mitzrayim um, by the Jewish people before we went out from Egypt, along with matzah um, and uh, and and bitter herbs and with with maror. Um, so why do we maror with the Koran Pesach and and matzah? Um, feel free always to shout things out. Um, so the, this answer that we find in Rashi isn't going to surprise anyone because it's the answer we're familiar with, I think. So um, Rashi comments on this Pasuk, that you'll eat it with the maror and the unleavened bread. Um, so he, he commanded that, I think the, uh, when I cut and paste this, it got a little bit messed up in my sources, but uh, every bitter herb, he commanded them to eat something bitter as a reminder of, of, uh, of Egypt when they were enslaved and the Egyptians made right. their lives bitter. Uh, right. So the, the reason why we have, right. according to Rashi, the reason why we have, we eat bitter it's herbs on Pesach is to remind us about the bitterness of slavery. Is this live? Yes. Yes, I, I, I can hear you, so it is live. Um, <laughs> and Rashi's well, okay. answer for why we have to eat maror is really based on uh, it's very clearly based on the Gemara that appears in Pesachim. So there, uh, the Mishnah says, Rabbi Gamaliel would say, anyone who did not say these three matters on, on Pesach has not fulfilled his obligation. The Korban Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, the bitter herbs. And it explains Maror, the bitter herbs, because the Egyptians embittered our forefathers' lives in Egypt, as it is stated, and they embittered their lives. That's where Rashi is getting his answer from. The second part of, that's interesting, so Rashi understands Maror to be about remembering, uh, reminding us about the bitterness of slavery. The second, that's, that's point number one that Rashi makes. The second point, just to tuck away in the back of your mind right now, we're going to come back to it, is that Rashi has also told us that any type of bitter herb, it can be used for Maror. Anything with a bitter taste can be used for Maror. Um, so that I don't think at this point anyone is too surprised. This is the understanding of Maror that we are used to, that it's to remind us of the bitterness of slavery. So, but if we look in the Orachayim HaKadosh, the Orachayim is also uh, sort of a late medieval uh, commentary on the, on the Chumash. Uh, he lived in Israel and, and, and Italy. He provides us with a very different answer for why we eat Maror. Uh, or why, and why, why we have the bitter herbs on Pesach at the Seder. He writes, together with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, commenting on that Pesach again, the plain meaning of the verse seems to be that the roasting of the lamb whole is a symbol of freedom. Okay, the Koran Pesach is a symbol of freedom. That makes sense. Freedom means wholeness. The requirement to eat bitter herbs with it is natural. Egyptians used to roast meat with something pugnant, as this enhanced the taste of the meat and enables the person who ate it to thoroughly enjoy his meal. Letting the bitter herbs precede the meal in his mouth makes one more conscious of the contrast and of how something which by itself had tasted bitter would suddenly transform the whole meat into an enjoyable experience. 
The unleavened bread also contributed to that feeling. We therefore find that there were three components which combined to make the meal most enjoyable. Yeah. Why does the Orachim think we have to have bitter herbs with the Koran Pesach? Really to make the enjoyment of it. Right. Not, not to remind us of the bitterness of slavery, but the, the Orachim is telling us what anyone who's ever had a shawarma lafa could ha can understand. They ask you in Israel, when you get, a, when you get shawarma in your lafa, do you want harit, right? Do you want something spicy with it? Because it brings out, um, it brings out the taste of the meat. Um, and he says that's exactly the way people would eat meat in, in, uh, in, in not just today in the Middle East, but in antiquity as well. Uh, and that the moror isn't to remind us of slavery, but instead it's to, to enhance our meal. Now, th this is obviously a very different way of looking at the moror from what we're used to. Now, it's not a bit reminder of the minister of slavery. It's meant to enhance the meal, and it's really connected. It's totally about um, freedom which the Koran Pesach is also about, and Matzah obviously is also about as well. And I think this makloke about the nature of Maror is really connected to a earlier disagreement that appears all the way in the Gemara and continues through into the Rishon. So let's keep going and we'll see how, how these things come together. So the Gemara um, later on in Sachim, uh, discusses more about the nature of the mitzvah of maror uh, and, and matzah. So Rav, the Gemara tells us that Rava said the mitzvah of matzah nowadays, even after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, even after the destruction of the temple, applies by Torah law. That there's a mitzvah deraita even now for us to eat matzah on the Seder night. But the mitzvah to eat bitter herbs applies only by rabbinic law. Uh, so we have a mitzvah de Raita to eat matzah and a mitzvah de Rabbanon to eat maror, according to Rava. The Gemara asks, and why, in what way is the mitzvah of maror different from matzah? Once you say one is a, uh, a mitzvah, uh, a mitzvah de Rabbanon, maybe they both are. Um, so the explanation for Rava's opinion is that as it is written, with regard to the Korban Pesach, the Paschal lamb, they shall eat it with matzo and bitter herbs, from which it was derived. That's the that's the uh, a restating of the pasuk in 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 Bamidbar, um, it, it, uh, similar to the one we saw in Shmo. When uh, when there and according to that pasuk, when there's an obligation to eat the Quran Pesach, there's likewise an obligate a mitzvah to eat maror. And when there's no obligation to eat the Quran Pesach, there's no obligate there's no mitzvah to eat maror. Um, and today, obviously, we don't have a Beit HaMikdash. There's no place to bring the Koran Pesach, so there's no mitzvah to bring the Koran Pesach. Um, okay. And ac according to uh, this reasoning, there's no mitzvah from the Torah to eat maror. There's still a mitzvah, the Chazal, the rabbi, still decreed that you should have maror, but there's no biblically mandated mitzvah to eat maror at the Seder. The Gemara uh, asks, but if so, the same reasoning should also apply to matzah. Because as we saw, right, it says that all these things together, as it's written with matzo and bitter herbs, the mitzvah of matzo should also depend on the obligation of the Koran Pesach. But the Gemara rejects this contention because the verse repeats the obligation to eat matzo, as it says in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, in the evening, you shall eat matzo. So there's a, another Pasuk that tells us explicitly you have to eat uh, matzo on the Seder night, independent of doing the Koran Pesach. But maror seems to be intricately linked to bringing the Koran Pesach. So this verse establishes a separate obligation to eat matzah unrelated to the Koran Pesach. So according to Rava, there's a mitzvah, uh, a mitzvah from the Torah to eat matzah, even today, even if we can't bring the Koran Pesach, but there's no longer a mitzvah to eat maror from the Torah, with, unless you're also bringing the Koran Pesach. Today, we, according to Rava, we have to have maror because the rabbis decreed it, um, but it's on a different level than the midst of eating matzah, and it's on a different level than if we were bringing the Koran Pesach. For some reason, there's a maror and the Koran Pesach are, inextric, are uh, intricately linked, um, and they can't be separated. Rav Acha Bar Yaakov disagrees, and he says nowadays, both this midst of eating matzah and that mitzvah eat bitter herbs apply only by rabbinic law. So for uh, Rav Ahab Yaakov, 
Matzah and Maror always exist on the same level. They're tied to the Quran Pesach, so they're activated at the <coughs> biblical level when you can bring a Quran Pesach, when you can bring the Quran Pesach, when you can bring the, uh, the Paschal Lamb. Um, but they, they exist together, and each one of that triad that we saw, the Quran Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, each stands on it, each has its own independent stand. Now, who, to po who do we follow? Well, that gets fleshed out amongst the, uh, the medieval authorities. Uh, so if we look in the Rambam, um, and this reminder, Maimonides um, also knows the Rambam, along with writing his great philosophical work, uh, The Guide for the Perplexed, Mori Nebuchim, also wrote the first uh, halachic, uh, extensive halachic code, the Mishnah Torah. Um, and he writes there, when he uh, was discussing this mitzvah of Maror, he says that according to the Torah, the mitzvah, the eating of bitter herbs is not a mitzvah in its own right, but rather it is dependent on the consumption of the Paschal sacrifice of eating the Quran Pesach. It is one positive commandment, eat the meat of the Paschal sacrifice together with matzah and bitter herbs. According to the words of our sages, it's a mitzvah to eat bitter herbs alone on this night, even if there is no Quran Pesach. So according to the Rambam, the Rambam is following Rava, um, that first opinion we saw in the Gemara, that eating maror is on a biblical level, a Torah level, is complete, always tied to the Quran Pesach. That those two things can't be separated. Um, maror and the Quran Pesach always go together as one mitzvah. Now, at the same time, the Rambam was, or uh, say, roughly the same time, the same medieval period, that um, the Rambam was compiling his list of the 613 mitzvot, as well as writing the Mishnah Torah. Um, there was this, this, a similar project, not in terms of a halachic code, but in terms of counting up the mitzvot and arguing about what exactly, co what constituted exactly identifying each of the 613 commandments was going on um, in Ashkenazi countries, in France and Germany. So based on just what we said in the Rambam, is there a, a separate mitzvah to eat maror of the 613? No, there's not. There's a mitzvah to eat the Koran Pesach, and in, included in that is the mitzvah to eat maror. Um, so that's for the Rambam in Egypt. If we um, move ahead, uh, say 100 years or so, and we move pretty much directly north from Egypt, I guess, to Germany, um, maybe a little bit west also. We get to where the uh, Sefer Yerim is being written, um, also, a, uh, also a, a, um, a medieval commentary, uh, and it was written by one of the uh, writers of Tosavo, one of the major commentaries on the Gemara. Um, so in his list, this is a list of the 613 commandments, he writes, as one of the commandments is, eating of the bitter herbs. So he thinks that there's a separate mitzvah to eat maror, on a, um, at, that at least sometimes is a, comes into play on, a, on, a, on, um, uh, on the Torah level. Eating of bitter herbs, we are commanded in the time of the Bechem Mikdash, in the time of the temple, to eat the paschal sacrifice. And on the sac paschal sacrifice, we are commanded to eat bitter herbs. In a time when there is a paschal sacrifice, there is a commandment, there's a biblical commandment to eat bitter herbs. And in a time when there's not a paschal sacrifice, there's not a biblical requirement to eat bitter herbs. So even though he acknowledges that there's a connection between eating maror and the Koran Pesach, maror has the status of being its own mitzvah. There's something unique about maror and the experience of eating maror that gives it, that gives it an equal status to that of the Koran Pesach. Even though the Torah tells us they should be eaten together, it has some unique standing um, on its own. Mickey, was that a question? Maybe not. Okay, I thought someone was asking a question. Um, I want to sort of put this um, discussion, this part of the discussion, on hold for a moment and move to a bit of history, and then we're going to come back to this. But for right now, I, just to rehash where we are, we have a uh, dispute amongst the Mepharshim who comment on the Chumash, 
between Rashi and the Orachayim about what, um, why we eat maror. Rashi said that it's about bitterness. The Orachayim said it's to enhance the taste of the Koran Pesach. The Orachayim seems to be a lot like the Rambam, that there's a, in, there's a connection, that, an unbreakable connection between maror and the, the Korban Pesach, whereas Rashi, perhaps, is more like Sefer Yerim. He sees maror as, yes, being linked to the Koran Pesach, but also having some standing in and of, its, of itself, having a message that is separate from the Korban Pesach. So putting that discussion on hold for just a moment, um, let's do a little bit of history, because I promised, uh, I promised a little bit of history tonight as well. Um, what do we use for marble? Now, growing up, oh, sorry, Muriel, I can't hear you. Horseradish. Horseradish, okay. Jacob said it. Uh, Muriel, are you going to say the same thing? Okay, so Jacob said horseradish. I also, growing up, always used horseradish. Um, Chaim's family always used romaine lettuce. Romaine lettuce. Um, and um, so some people use romaine lettuce, some people use horseradish. Uh, why are we using all sorts of different things? Some people put the horseradish on the romaine lettuce. Um, <laughs> or, <laughs> I, I said I love that. that. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there are a couple different things it seems like people do. Why, why, why is that? Um, customs. So, so if we look in the Mishnah in Psachim that describes what can be used for maror, this is what it lists. And these are the herbs with which one dis discharges, fulfills his obligation on Pesach with hazeret, which in modern Hebrew means horseradish, but in rabbinic Hebrew actually meant lettuce, with oh. chicory, with wild chicory, with Picrudium, um, or and with um, sanchus. I actually don't know what some of these are, but for, I know they're all basically more leafy vegetables. Um, uh, they're all they're all leafy vegetables. Um, why isn't horseradish on this list? If most Ashkenazim um, use it, or many Ashkenazim use it, it says that it's not even listed. It's not part of the Middle East. Uh, yes. Okay. Custom. So Gloria read ahead to the next source. Um, but there was someone who was doing a degree in um, horticology, I think at Johns Hopkins in the 80s, and he wrote a very long essay, which is a, a fabulous read I'm happy to share with people if they're interested, called The History of Horseradish as the Bitter Herb of, the, of, the pa of Passover. Um, and uh, now he's a professor at the University of Israel, actually. Um, so this is what he wrote. He said, our use of horseradish is predicated on its identification with Tamcha. Both the Babylonian and the Jerusalem Talmuds identify Tamcha in their respective vernaculars. The Babylonian Talmud is of little help when it states Tamcha, Amarava Bar Barhana, Tamchata Shama. So what the Babylonian Talmud basically told us about, about what the meaning of Tamcha is, is they translated Tamcha into uh, Aramea, Babylonian Aramea, um, but that doesn't help us because we don't actually know what that word means in Babylonian Aramaic either. Um, so for a scholar, that was uh, of no use. Um, however, the Jerusalem Talmud is a bit more helpful. It defines Tamcha as um, the, another word that seems to be of Greek origin, but its identification, as he writes, has been the object of some discussion and suggestions, but it's certainly not identified with horseradish. Whether or not horseradish even existed in the Middle East, during the Mishnaic or Talmudic times is a difficult question to answer, but the general assumption among scholars is that it did not. Mm. Um, so horseradish uh, did not, clearly was not what the Mishnah was talking about. Um, and actually that, um, it seems like the Rambam also clearly yeah, was not using, Is not the word right. sam, is the word sam, but this is Sam. Is the word samka has to do with a custom for the Italian Jews eating endives instead of lettuce or uh, oh. bitter herbs. Mm -hmm. Definitely endives is also on the, on the list. Um, I'm not sure if, um, 
endives is definitely one of the ones that's listed. I don't because think I don't, the Italian Jews for sure that's what they put on their uh, seder plate, right? Instead of lettuce, right? So that clearly goes all the way back to that. That that clearly is on the clearly was on Ram, the Rambam's list, um, and and was and was on the uh, was on the Mishnah's list as well. But that's also so. If we look in the Rambam, the Rambam says the bitter herbs referred to by the Torah are romaine lettuce, endives, uh, wild chicory, date ivy, and wormwood. Um, all these five species of vegetables are called maror. And if a person eats a kazayit, an, an olive size, of any of these species, or all five of these species combined, he's fulfilled his obligation. So endive sam also, right, is a leafy vegetable, I think. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, it is. Okay. Um, I, I had to Google some of these so that I could see them. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but it would make all of them are leafy vegetables and lettuce and endives they grow fairly easily um, in the uh, in the Mediterranean region, which is why Italian Jews obviously use them um, and why the Rambam thought you didn't need anything for the um, more than what was on this list. All of these were easily accessible, certainly in the springtime um, in uh, in Egypt, and that. He understood, the, the, he understood, it seems like, the Mishnah's list to be exhaustive. If you wanted to fulfill the mitzvah of Maror, you needed one of these things to eat, to use, to use for the mitzvah of Maror. And if you didn't have one of those things, you, you, according to the Rambam, you might very well be out of luck. Um, uh, but, the, but remember, if we just go think back to that first Rashi we read, um, 20 minutes or so ago, Rashi said anything that uh, has the, any herb that, ha that has a bitter taste can be used for maror. Well, matter. if it's for the purpose of enhancing the taste of the food, obviously that's something we can use even parsley, uh, anything that is leafy, like you said. But if uh, we go the other way, that it's not just for increasing the taste of the food, and it's for the mitzvah of eating something bitter, and that's where the, the conflict comes in. Either or, both of them is to remind us, I think, is the bitter, bitterness that our forefathers uh, suffered in Egypt. So I think, we're, I think you're right. I think both of them would agree that there's an ask that we want to remember that bitterness. The question is going to be how we remember it. We're going to come back to that. Um, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. But just to sort of wrap up the history, how we get to horseradish, um, is that even though the, we don't really find any evidence that um, Jewish communities were using horseradish for maror until fairly late. Uh, in most of the medieval period uh, in Germany and France, there are occasional references to horseradish connected to Pesach, but not with maror. They're in haroset recipes. Um, mm. So we and and the regular the broader um, German horse community uh, used horseradish the way people use horseradish today. So I was actually googling uh, around sort of a history of horseradish, and just on the Wikipedia page for horseradish, they have a quote from a 15th century English botanist who remarks that um, the horseradish stamped with a little vinegar put there too is commonly used amongst Germans for a sauce to eat fish with such like meats, as we do with mustard. So apparently the way they did it, they put mustard on things in England, they put horseradish on things, um, right? In, uh, in Germany, I don't think that's, um, that's going to surprise anyone too much. That would be more of an enhancement than actual flour, possibly. Yes, right there it's clearly to make, the, to make it taste better. So the first time that we have evidence um, that people were using, horseradish for maror comes in the Hagot Maimonides, um, which is a 13th century commentary on the Mishnah Torah. And one of the things, especially uh, medieval Ashkenazic uh, commentators love to do, and you see Rashi do this sometimes also, is they would like to, tra they would translate things into their local talk. Um, occasionally, if you look through a translated version of Rashi, you'll see something like Rashi translates the word into Old French. Um, and that's exactly what happens here. So 
in this work, if you look just at the, um, the second line, uh, Samcha is translated as meat rich. Um, and meat rich in, uh, in German is horseradish. Um, so apparently this was, um, this is his commentary on where the Rambam talks about, uh, lists those, um, lists which herbs can be used for maror. Um, and here's the first time that we have an association. It factually, it almost certainly is incorrect. Um, but it, here's the first time we have an association between Samcha and mm. as being horseradish. So uh, Samcha is what language? Samcha is rabbinic Hebrew. Okay. Um, Mitrich is German. Okay. Uh, because, and probably what, now the, this, even this, uh, source is sort of questionable because this is a 13th century text. We don't find another reference anywhere to horseradish being used as maror for almost another 200 years until the 15th century. So some people, some scholars think that this might've been a, um, a later insertion. I'm, I, that I don't really know so much about the, the sort of academic scholarship about it, but certainly there's no evidence before this that people were using uh, horseradish as, as maror. So why was there a turn to horseradish? Deep and abundant. Because um, Jews are living in, in the Ukraine and you can't, get, you can't get lettuce. Exactly. So as Jews move first into North, in the, in the early medieval period, and really even the, the, the high, high medieval period, Jews are living largely, they're living in Italy for sure, they're living in Spain, they're living in Germany, oftentimes Southern Germany, and they're living in, in Southern France. But as Jew, Jewish communities are, are pushed out of France and Germany um, uh, in, the high, in the sort of high medieval period, the Jewish communities begin to move uh, east and they begin to move north. And of course, especially as um, in a year when Pesach comes early, um, as it does this year, it, it's going to be very hard. It's going to be very likely you're not going to be able to get lettuce in northern Germany at the beginning of April. And certainly not in, in Ukraine um, or parts of Poland, Lithuania. Um, and that's why Jewish communities have to come up with, uh, with something else to eat. Rabbi, could that be that also horseradish really makes you cry to remind you of the bitterness? From all the leaf vegetable that we are supposed to eat as a bitter herb, that's the only one that really makes you cry. Well, right. I think that there are sources that say that. But my sense with those sources is that's sort of a later justification. People were explaining why they were using horseradish, even though it wasn't on the Mishnah's list. Um, that's what that, but you are right. That certainly horseradish, I think, is more, is bit more bitter, more pugnant than, than anything else on the list. Yeah. Um, so where does that leave us? I think what we, what we see, if we look back, if we think back to that medieval dispute that existed between Rashi and the Orachayim about whether or not uh, the, uh, the Marora is about, uh, is about reminding, whether or not the herbs are about reminding, giving us a taste of the bitterness of slavery or whether or not they're about enhancing the taste. And also if we think about whether or not that dispute about whether or not the bitter herbs, the Marora has a standing on its own, um, or whether or not it's, it, it's, it, um, it's always connected to the Koran Pesach, I think that offers us um, sort of a, a profound lesson to consider. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, that, uh, let, so let's take a look at this next source and then I'm going to come back to that. So Hal Ben Shahar, we actually heard from his brother earlier this year. Um, his brother spoke about Israel advocacy, but Hal Ben Shahar is a, um, is a psychology professor in Israel. Um, and he's, he writes that we're told that it's improper to display our anxiety when listening to a lecture. Uh, so, we're so we suppress any form of anxiety when we're writing in our journal. We learn that it's indecent to cry while sitting in a streetcar. So we hold in our tears even when we are in the shower. Anger does not win us friends, and over time we lose our ability to express anger and solitude. When we keep emotions in, when we suppress or repress, ignore or avoid, we pay a high price. I'm just going to stop there. You can read the rest of it um, if you want. But what the what Talban Shahar is saying is that there's a time when bitterness is okay. 
when sadness is okay, when anger is okay. And that this idea that Maror is about making us, that the bitter herbs are really about experiencing the bitterness of slavery, and that Maror has a standing on its own, independent of the Koran Pesach, which is associated with redemption. I think that idea, that way of thinking, really relates to this. That if we always associate Maror with the Koran Pesach, we're always associating bitterness with slavery, with bitterness with redemption. That's telling us that we can't ever be sad in a way without knowing we're going to be redeemed, without rejoicing at the same time. We right. always have to look at everything by saying it with a glass half full approach. We always have to say there's a silver lining in every cloud. And sometimes, sometimes that's a good thing, but there are also moments in life when it's okay to be down, when it's okay to be sad, when it's okay to be upset and to express that emotion just to be bitter, just to feel like you're missing something. And I think especially this year, that might be where we find ourselves, at the, especially at the beginning of the Seder, that this is not going to be a normal Seder for any of us, and that it's going to be complicated. We're yeah. going to feel like something is missing when we look at our table when, or when we're sitting alone. And that feeling that bitterness, being in that moment with that sadness, that's all right. That's Rashi's approach to Maror. That's Sefi Arim's approach to Maror. That Maror mm -hmm. stands alone as a reminder of bitterness. And that sometimes it's okay just to focus on that loss and that sadness without any other emotion. But Rashi's approach and the Orachayim's approach is one that says the bitterness always comes with some aspect of redemption. Um, that's always connected to redemption. And Rabbi Norman Lamb, uh, who was the president of Yeshiva University for many years, um, I think puts it very nicely when he says that, but the message of Maror is more than just an awareness of the bittersweet taste of life, more than just the idea that every black cloud has a silver lining. What Mor Maror wants to tell us is that misery is not meaningless, that pain is not pointless punishment, that human anguish has, a larger, has large dimensions, that bitterness leads to the sweet. In fact, without the foretaste of Maror, Harosa loses its value. There can be no sweet without bitter, no light without darkness before it, no joy without prior sadness. There can be no wealth without poverty, no faith without doubt, no freedom without slavery, no redemption without exile. A people that dips murrow into haroset and makes a bracha over right. it is defeated neither by faith nor by foe. A foe that can find the mellow in a morsel of misery can drive away the darkness with its own light, the outer sorrow with the inner joy. So there is this, the other approach is one that says, all sadness ultimately finds this redemption. And that's an article of our faith, that joy and hope and goodness will always triumph. And that is the level we want to get to. That is the way we want to eat the maror. It might not be the way we taste the maror this year, but that is where we will ultimately go when we look back on this experience. I'm actually going to wrap things up right now because I'm running rapidly out of time. But if you have any questions about PESA, please call me, please email me. I'm on a 40 minute time limit on Zoom. Um, <laughs> we're going to wrap up. Um, it was really good to see everyone. And um, please feel free to call me or email me with any specific questions um, that you have. I have, hope it is a healthy and joyous uh, PESA for us all. Shkoyev. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice seeing everyone. Good, Good to see, see you, Judy everybody. and Dick and Riva and Archie yeah, and Muriel and Harvey. Good to see everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Hi. 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 Love you. Love you, too.